Uh, it is five o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, that'd be good. I think that's a good call. We're getting some door closets going on. Um, so we have, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a big smart. Aparna, um, I don't know if you are up for this, but I just made you a co-host. So feel free to admit everyone as they're coming in. If they have questions, let them know what's going on. Yep. Ooh, you're, you're, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right, and we are recording, and uh, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to get started, everyone. Cool, cool, cool. All right, well, hello, everybody. Thank you to our in-person uh, people that came today. Thank you to our people uh, tuning in from afar over Zoom. Uh, my name is Quint, and I am the workshops coordinator and uh, education person for Flux, the user experience club. So we're going to talk about Figma and all the different ways we can use it. Um, so first, we're going to go over a little bit of theory that's just going to be in this presentation here. After that, we're going to do a quick demo, and I'm going to show everyone how to do different things in Figma. And I've set aside about 10 minutes at the end to do a little bit of Q&A. So if you have more specific questions, we're going to answer those then. Uh, I do want to set a couple of ground rules. Participation is expected. It is not required, but I expect you guys to ask questions or if you do need anything, let me know. I'm definitely here for all that. I am not the one true expert. I am not the Figma god. I know that uh, there's lots of different ways to do things in Figma, and that's one of the reasons it's so powerful. Um, but I do have a couple of techniques that I've developed over about a year or two that I think might be really helpful for everybody. The last thing is afterwards, reach out if you have any questions. Uh, I'm here for all of you guys if you do need any further learning. So uh, definitely feel free to uh, reach out afterwards uh, if there's anything you need. So this is the UX process, uh, vaguely defined. Someone pointed at me outside. Um, and Figma, when we're doing Figma prototyping, generally speaking, that's going to fall in this design area. After we've kind of done our research and defined what we're going to do, once we start designing is when we're going to use Figma uh, for what we use it for. And we use Figma and, and different prototyp uh, prototyping tools do a couple things. One of them is test. So we want to know how people are going to react to this thing. We don't know everything. Uh, we only have our finite human view of the world. And so uh, we might not know other people's perspectives. So we build prototypes to test. We also do it to eliminate our blind spots as much as possible. There are certain things that I wouldn't have even thought of, but because I did testing, I was able to get someone else's perspective, which is really good. And also they hand off to developers so that they have a more clear uh, example of what you want from them when we do actually go to make this final product. This is just an example from Dribble that I got of uh, what it might look like to have a prototype. You guys have seen these before. They're basically screenshots of what an app would look like if you use them, but they're filled with some fake data and if you tap stuff, sometimes they work, but it's not a real app. It's not coded in anything. And there's a couple different uh, prototyping tools available. So uh, these are a couple of the biggest ones right now. And uh, we actually went ahead and ranked them in a couple key metrics, uh, vector editing, interaction, and how that works, plugin support, which is a big deal for some of these, and also collaboration, how easy it is to work with everyone else. And for today's purposes, we're going to talk about Figma. Figma is free. It's available online, so it's not just one platform. Uh, some of them, like Sketch, is only available on Mac, and so we wanted to do something that's available to everybody. Oh, and it's also very capable. Um, so it's it's very uh, powerful as a tool. Uh, so if you need to use it for different things, it can it can be used for those. So without further ado, we're going to go into a demo of how Figma works, and uh, we're going to follow along in three key different areas. So let's get started with that. Did all that make sense to everybody? Does anyone have some questions thus far? All right, looks like we're all good. Looks like we're good. Cool, cool, cool. All right, and- oh, I have one question. Oh, go for it, Keisha. So if I become you know, quite fluent in Figma and the company that I wanna work for is quite wants me to use sketch how easy is it to uh, adapt yourself over to a different like program um figma has a lot of uh, quite acid i don't know if you guys can hear very well uh, or hear everything that he said how easy is it to translate figma skills to a, a different program if, if your company wants you to use that one um 
Figma has a lot of really nice quality of life features that make it honestly just a pleasure to work with. But the core things that we're going to talk about today are applicable to pretty much any app. Uh, you're going to have vector editing to some degree, components, styles, and then also uh, some kind of prototyping tools. So these are kind of the foundational basics. Um, what I've actually found is that if you go into those companies and start using Figma and showing them everything you can do, sometimes they'll actually switch to Figma based on the proof of uh, concept that you give them. Not to say that's a guaranteed or anything, but I've, I've had that experience a couple of times now. All right, so uh, big reveal time. This presentation was done on Figma. Dun, 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 dun. I thought that was cool. You can use it for presentations too, not just prototypes. Um, so something we're going to do is we're going to go over here to the pages, and this is a different page on the Figma uh, prototype or this Figma file here. So I'm just going to go to design demo, and I have put together a little design demo for everybody. So we're going to work through this together, and if you have any questions, uh, kind of stop me along the way. One of the things I am going to do is I am going to assume that you have some level of experience with uh, vector programs. So I'm not going to show you like how to make a square or something like that. That's pretty self-explanatory. I trust you guys are able to do that. But um, Figma has a couple of really cool tools that we can get into uh, and a couple of different ways to interact with them as well. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So first thing we're going to do is our shapes are up here on the left. Figma has a couple interesting ones like this polygon shape. So if we make a polygon, you can see it's a triangle, but we can kind of move this here to get a radius and we can choose how many sides we want it to have on this right inspector panel here. So that is nice. We can also go through and do a star. Stars have a couple different attributes. So uh, we can see how many points that star has and also the ratio of how far out it goes. Um, so this is pretty standard for stuff like Illustrator. Um, or other similar programs. One of the cool things that I love about the ellipse tool, and you can kind of see it down here with this Pac-Man example, is that we get this little uh, nubbin when we, we uh, hover over it. And we can move this back and forth and we can get kind of this Pac-Man-like shape. We can change where it starts and we can also change the ratio. So this is really good for some of these radial things that you might want to do, like a dial or a timer or something like that. Uh, this is a really good example of uh, how to do that. Now, this is a little different than the one I did before. I want to see how many different ways we can make a circle. And I want you guys and you guys in Zoom to tell me. I'm going to start with an easy one. There is a circle tool. How else do you think we can make a circle? Pencil. OK, so there is a pen tool. We could make a, a circle with that. Uh, or the pencil tool, we can draw out a circle. What about perfect circles, though? I'll give you kind of a, a, another way to think of it. So if I make a rectangle. Hey, Quint, really quick, um, is it possible it. to share this file with everyone in the Zoom right now just so that they could follow along? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to go ahead and share and copy the link. And uh, I'm going to go to chat and paste it there for you guys. Google. I don't know. I could make a bit.ly real quick if you guys wanted to do that. Um, or let's see. Can I airdrop it to people? I don't, <laughs> I don't think I can. <laughs> um, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, let me do that real quick. Sure. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So, uh, getting back to that, let's plug ourselves back in, share that desktop one. All right, so one example of what I was talking about, another way to make a circle if we want to do that is we can actually round the corners of a square all the way into the middle. And that's another way to make a circle. Another thing we can do, it's kind of similar, um, but we can make a star 
and then just give it a ton of points. Oh. There we go. So we can just give it a ton of points. That makes something close enough to a circle. And we can also round these points if we want. And same thing for a polygon. Now, why is this important? Sometimes we need to be able to make circles out of other shapes because these other shapes have things we can do that uh, we wouldn't be able to do normally in a circle. So when we talk about auto layout, that's going to be an example of something that we can only do in a rectangle. But if we do it in a rounded rectangle that's just rounded all the way, we can actually get away with doing it inside of a circle, which is a really cool thing. Um, one other thing that I just want to touch on for uh, the shapes area is that each one of these uh, things in the side, so if we go to this dude here, each one of these uh, text boxes on the right side has the ability to do math. And what I mean by that is that if I have uh, something like this, where my octagon is uh, circumscribed and I want it to look more like a stop sign, I can actually go in here and I, I can say, okay, so there's 360 degrees. If I divide that by two because I want it to move half of one, and I divide that by eight because I have eight sides, we can actually get it so that it's that right orientation without having to guess. Unfortunately, Figma does not snap to 22.5, so we can't just do it like this, working around like that, but we can if we uh, put in that math. So same thing, like if I wanted to make it bigger, I can do this times, we'll say, oh, times 0.8. And it'll move down that size too. So this is a really good way to scale or move different objects if that's what you want to accomplish mathematically, which is really great. Another thing is that each one of these, if you hover over the kind of illustration that's next to it, you get the ability to slide back and forth. And this is something I do all the time because it gets me a much more natural looking design because I can look at the object on my screen and I can say, okay, let's round, round, round. Okay, that looks good. And then I can stop. I don't know. Okay, so that was two. I rounded it by two pixels. I'm not going to know that off the top of my head, but I know how it looks good. So um, that's kind of another uh, area for it. Cool, cool, cool. And that's shapes. Obviously, there's much more we can do with those, but we're going to move on to text. And it looks like Aparna has a task for us. She says, hey there, I need you to fix that text to my right so that it's more parametric. Also, can you make it all caps? Thanks. Well, Aparna, I think we can do that. So one of the things with text boxes that I see all the time with people who are using Figma is that we don't give it the right parameters. Now, how do we tell what the right parameter is? That has to do with the text box itself. So for example, if I wanted to say flux, hello there, instead of just hello, and I go to edit this, oh no. Oh, did you guys just catch what happened there? This is a travesty. It moved out to the side. Why? Because someone centered the text. So. What we want to do instead is we want to have that text left aligned so that we, when we expand it, it'll go the right way. This is something I see all the time and it changes based on where that thing is. So for example, these items are left aligned. So we probably want them to be left aligned on the uh, text box. Another thing is that we have these three bounding box modes down in that bottom right area. And these give us the ability to do different things with our text. So for example, this title box here is one single line of text, so it is auto width. If I keep on typing here, the width will change automatically, which is what I want. Put that back in there. For this one, though, I don't want it to change the width. I actually want this text box to stay the same size as whatever my text is. But if I try to add in more text here, you can see the text box doesn't grow. That's a problem, especially as we get to things like auto layout. We want that text size to be uh, reflecting how big that text actually is. So I'm gonna select this option, which is auto height. And magically, this text box will change its height based on how much text I have in it, which is really great. This is also a good time to talk about plugins. So uh, I know a lot of people uh, ask about Lorem Ipsum. There isn't official Figma support for this, but we can use a plugin. I'm just gonna press Command P here and type in Lorem Ipsum. And there's lots of these different little, almost mini apps within Figma that you can get that'll do different things. So for this one, I'm just gonna say, go ahead and auto-generate the perfect amount of text for inside of this. And look at that, it auto-generated the perfect amount of text. So there's lots of interactions like this. Uh, I've spent hours going through all the different plugins you can get for Figma. I know uh, Aparna probably has a couple of recommendations too. We probably all do if we used Figma before, but um, this is a big part of using Figma is plugins uh, inside that experience. Cool, cool, cool. So last thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at these different things. And I want you to think about 
where these text boxes should be aligned so that when they expand, they go the right way. So for example, where should this text box be aligned? We're just worrying about these three right now. Centered. Centered, fantastic. What about this down one? Should that be centered? Should it be left, right aligned? Also centered, fantastic. What about this right text box? Should that be left or right aligned? Left aligned, even though it says right, it should be left aligned because our anchor point is over here. And then left, of course, should be right aligned. Um, the other thing about these is that we should probably change them so that they are auto width. And what that does is it just makes it so that the text box is exactly the size of that item. So that when we go in here, uh, it, it just kind of expands by itself. Cool, 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 that's looking good. All right, so now if I were to type uh, maybe left side, see how it expands the way that I want it to, no harm, no foul. The last thing Aparna needs us to do is we need to change it so that it's all caps. And you could go through and rewrite these in all caps. But Figma has something really cool. If we go to this little dot, dot, dot on the side here, we can change the letter case. So I can make this all caps. And because I set it up parametrically, you might not have even noticed, but when that text box got bigger, it said, okay, my anchor's on the left, I'm gonna expand this way. And that just makes it so much easier for people to design. We don't even give them the option to be wrong. If I write up here, but without even holding down shift, I'm gonna type U and P, it does it capital, which is what we want. Does anybody have any questions about text and how text works in Figma? Are we all good? Cool, cool, cool. I know it's a lot. Auto layout, you haven't come. Not at all. That's the last thing we're going to cover, and it's it's a little difficult to wrap your mind around, but um, we'll we'll talk about that. But you can think of auto layout almost like how we're talking about the text boxes right now. It kind of automatically sizes things based on the content inside of it. Okay. All right, another tool within Figma is the pen tool. And uh, I don't have it right now because I have a pencil tool. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And I don't personally use the pen tool a whole lot in Figma. I know some people who do. Um, but what I usually use it for is I have this SVG icon here. And maybe I want these corners here to be a little bit more rounded. So I'm going to double click on this item to uh, edit it. And let's go ahead and shift click on all these different corners so that I can change their roundedness. And so once I clicked on all these guys up here, just like on the rectangle and all the other shapes, we have this corner radius. I can bump this up a couple times. And now I have my perfectly rounded shape. That is pretty much the extent of the pen tool that I use at least inside Figma. But I mean, you can use it just like any other pen tool in Illustrator or uh, similar uh, graphic design apps. All right. And for our last one, we have images. These are the last basic types. <laughs> Sherry giggling. Um, these are the last basic types of uh, things. And we can do a lot of different things with these images. So uh, let's use Varun as our first example here. Um, Figma has a couple really high quality basic photo editing things. So if I double click on this, you can see over here, we have uh, different controls for exposure. Let's make them a, you know, just a little bit brighter. Maybe I want uh, some more contrast in here so it really stands out. Maybe I want some more saturation so that yellow is just, you know, really hitting hard. Uh, maybe for the temperature, we're going to warm it up a little bit. Um, and you can play with these just like any other photo editing app. Let's just get this, uh, this picture. You know, I like how that looks. Perfect. Another thing we can do uh, with our Andrew here is we can talk about blend mode. So blend modes are this whole topic of discussion, uh, but we can change what they are over here. So maybe... I wanted this to be negate. Maybe I want like demon Andrew. So uh, if I go here to difference, whoa, scary. <laughs> and if we go, oh, wow, something even weirder. I kind of like that. <laughs> so that's kind of fun too. Um, we can also go through here and let's take this picture of BC. And I'm going to show you guys the different image scaling modes. So one of the cool things about Figma that you'll notice almost immediately when you bring a photo in is that as you try to resize it, the photo itself actually changes its size too. It's not just the bounding box. So a little dance here. You can change how that works. So if I double click on this again, I can go over to this option here and instead of fill, maybe I want it to fit. The difference between these two is that if we say fill, it'll always fill whatever the uh, biggest size is. So if we go around here, or smallest rather, it'll go uh, on the smallest size, that's how it's defined. With fit, it scales to be whatever the uh, longest size is. So you can see here, this is the longer side, so it's gonna go over there. 
So we see the whole image basically. It's a question of whether or not we want the entire shape to be filled or if we want to see the entire image. Most of the time, especially for UX work, we're going to want that fill. Uh, the other thing we can do is crop it. So maybe I just want to see this part of his face. We can do that there. And we also have tile uh, in case we want to see lots and lots and lots of different VCs. And you can change how that tiles here if you'd like to as well. Um, one more thing we're going to go over for this section is different layer effects. So maybe I like this picture of Varun, but I want it to have a, just another yellow overtone on top of everything. So if we go over to the side uh, where we see fill here, you can see we do have one fill already, and that's an image, but we have a little plus button. So I'm going to click on this, and you can see that we have another fill on top of this one. So let's make this one even more yellow. Brune, is this a good shade of yellow for you? This kind of like palish yellow? Sure. Okay. Um, and we can change our how much that's affecting it. I like this. And then we can also change the blending mode. So if I want this just to be color, I can change that so it only affects the color, which is really great. We can also add strokes. We can uh, go through here and maybe change the color of what that stroke looks like. And just like with fills, we can go up here to where it says solid and we can actually choose what kind of stroke it is. So lots of different options for doing vector uh, designs with this. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the stroke. The last thing we can do is we can add effects. So I'm going to add a little drop shadow here. I like big blurs, so we're going to put that on. And maybe I also want it to have an inner shadow. So we're going to add in an inner shadow. And that looks good too. Cool, cool, cool. So you can have as many fills, effects, and strokes as you want. Um, and that's that's how fills, effects, and strokes work. Cool, cool, cool. So we had gone over the entire tool demo section. Does anybody have any questions about tools or how they work or different combinations of things we can do? So Adobe has like best practices of bringing in images into the software. Is can you just drag and drop in this? You can literally just drag and drop. It's wonderful. Okay. I see. <laughs> Oh, I, yes, I can uh, mute myself. Yeah. Go. Um, I see that there's uh, more than the four or five tools at the top that you explained. Could you explain what the, the first two do? The little arrow and the little, um, yeah, square with the line through it. Definitely. So uh, one of the things, oh, one of the things uh, that's uh, unique to Figma is that we have this frame tool. And over here, we have all these different kind of presets for our frames, but you can think of these oftentimes as screens or like when I was showing you my presentation, um, those were the different slides. It's essentially just a visual group of all the different objects. So uh, for example, you can see here, it says tool demo area, and this is a little frame. You can see on the left here by the layers. If I move this around, it moves everything around. Um, this guy over here is the move tool. Uh, I use V and K to switch between these two guys exclusively. Um, if I switch to V, that's kind of your normal cursor that moves stuff around. And uh, if I move this up, let's, let's move this guy. Oh, so this is something with text that's interesting about Figma is that when you change the size of the text box, it doesn't actually change the size of the text. If you want to do that, you go over here and either press K or then uh, scale. And now when I select these items and I move them, it'll affect everything on the inside, the font size. Um, if I had shadows, it would scale those shadows up as well. So that's the scale tool as well. Does that answer your question, Rune? Yeah. Marvelous, thank you so much. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so you guys have an understanding of Figma basics now, how to interact with it. Now let's talk about styles and components, or as I like to call them, the things that help you do more things with one thing. So if you go over here, this is an app design that I got off the Figma uh, platform for community. And uh, that's kind of another point that I want to talk to you guys about today too, is that the Figma community has lots of different resources for you. They have lots of different ways about going about things that you might even learn something better than how I taught it to you. Uh, Figma also does them for each one of their conferences and each new feature they launch. So you can learn those in depth as well. Um, but I just got this from community. I didn't, I didn't uh, design this myself. And if we look at our app screen here, we can see there's a couple common things. So uh, we have this kind of title text here, we have this heading text, uh, we have some normal text or body text and this like kind of caption text. 
The problem is if I were to maybe change what this looks like. So I have a font here, it's enter extra bold at 15.1. Maybe I don't like, you know, that size. Maybe I need it to be even bigger. So I'm gonna make this a 17 point and that's bigger. I'd have to go through every single one of my screens and change that all the time for each one. And being human, I would probably miss a couple and then we have inconsistencies. If I needed to change a font because of licensing issues, you know, I'd have to do every single font. And so it's a lot easier to go through and make what's called styles. So we can do styles for text and for uh, colors. If you want to think of them as a variable, I come from a computer science background, so I kind of think of them as variables. Um, but if you click just on a, on a frame or something like that, you can see over here, we actually have all of our text styles here, the title, heading, normal, and caption. And we also have some color styles, uh, which we'll make through here. So uh, I'll show you how to make that over here. So um, you have a fill for this color, and I'm gonna go ahead and click the styles button, which is this little four dots. And as I do that, I can see all of my uh, styles you might've seen in the presentation. I had a couple colors that I used for that, um, but I'm gonna add a new color style. And one of the very important things that I always do when I'm naming my color styles is I always misspell them on purpose because I think it's hilarious. So this is going to be green. This is going to be tan. This is going to be salmon. And this is going to be white. What that lets us do is we can reuse these colors throughout our entire design now. So uh, let's actually get some color inspiration from this photo. Whoa, okay, cool. So maybe this background here, I want this to be tan. So we're gonna change this fill and to apply this fill color, we aren't gonna go down here. We're gonna go to these little dots here and click on that button. And now if we were to change the definition of this color, maybe I don't like that tan. Maybe I want it to be a little bit uh, more orange. I can change all of those at the same time. So let's go through here and I am just going to maybe get our headings in green. I'm gonna change that. Let's make these guys green. Nice. And then maybe I want this and this to be that kind of salmon color. They're adding these colors in and it's changing with those. And if, if I needed to change that for whatever reason, I could go to this color, right click, edit style. And I can change what this color looks like on every single thing. And this is a really good workflow enhancer that helps you keep consistent colors throughout your entire design. So a lot of times I'll have what's called a key color where it's kind of like that app's color. And um, it makes it super easy to tweak that really quickly. Does everybody kind of think they understand how uh, styles work? Is everybody clear on styles? Cool, cool, cool. You can also do styles folders. So if we were right, I click on here, we can add a new folder. And maybe I want this to be app demo. We can add these in here. And that's a good way to keep organized. So that's more of the aesthetic side, but let's talk about functionality. So um, there are going to be just like different colors and different text styles. There are going to be different items in your app that you reuse a lot. Uh, one of them that's super easy to see is this back button. And we can actually see here that this back button is a component. We're going to uh, get rid of that so I can show you how to do components. So if I were to take this guy, let's copy and paste this over here. And this is my back button. And if I wanted to add a component to this back button and make this a component itself, uh, I'm gonna make it the right size. Um, but we can go up here. There's lots of different ways to make a component, but uh, one of them is to click this little diamond icon with the different squares up there. We can click on that and anything to do with components is going to be purple. So if you see something purple, you know this is a component. Um, and as I do this, check this out. If I were to copy this again, I'm just going to hold down option for duplicate and then drag this over. I'm going to make a couple of these. So uh, these would be on different pages in my app. Check this out. If I change this first one, whoa, they all change. Incredible. So this is a good way to keep consistent again through all your different apps. Maybe. You know, I decided that this specific arrow was, you know, not the color that I wanted it to be. I could go through here, I could change the color for it. Maybe I think it needs a stroke so that it's uh, a little bit more obvious what I'm doing. This is a terrible design, please don't do that. But um, I can also do that. And that affects all of the child elements if you edit this parent element. You can also go to a child element and maybe uh, I just want this one to move. You can see that it says, ooh, 
I don't want you to move anything because this is the parent element. So inside here, if I want to change something just about this one, I can click on this little dot, 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 and I can detach this instance. And so that way, this one will be free to do whatever I want it to do. It won't, however, change with the other ones if I do change the other ones. So that's kind of a one-time operation. And there's lots of things we could use components for. So uh, a lot of times people will have a tab bar that's a component. If we want to change this to be a component, we can right click on here and there should be the option to yeah, create component. We can also do option command K or alt uh, control K if we want to on Windows. And now this is a component. So if I were to move this again, maybe I don't like the way that this icon looks, I can go in here and maybe change this fill color to be a little bit uh, more like this one. So you can change all those different things and it'll propagate to all the different child elements. Components are a very big deal. You'll usually do them for buttons, sometimes even entire screens if you want to keep things consistent. Uh, modal popovers, there's lots of different things you can use components for. Something that's really cool about components is the ability to do what Figma calls, I'm just gonna grab all three of these guys here, variants. Variants are really nice. And if we go in here, we can see a couple different things about these. If we were to break this up into the different kind of notional areas, there's three different kinds of these items, right? We have uh, the pill that we take before we eat, the one that we take during we eat, or when we eat, and then the one we take after we eat. So we have three different, you know, kind of styles that we want to go for that indicate different things. And within these three, we also have two different options for either on or off. So this one, for example, is on. This is the, the active item. And then these two are the ones that are off. They're, they're not active. And so what we can do is we can actually do something really, really cool with this. So uh, I'm gonna make all these components with my keyboard shortcut, and I'm going to duplicate them. And we're going to style them. Oh, you know, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not going to duplicate them before I've made them components or after I've made them components because then they will be child elements. Um, and let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to detach this one too, and then make it its own component. So now I have uh, a couple different components that I can work with, and I'm gonna style these the same way that these other ones are. So let's go ahead and select all these guys here, and we are going to change these to be white, and then we're gonna change these backgrounds to be blue. So these are gonna be my active ones. And then down here, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'm just gonna change all these guys to be gray. I'm gonna change this background to be this kind of white color. So now we have all the different states that this component can be in, right? So what I can do here, if they're all components, is I can actually go through and select all of them and combine as variants. So what this means is that it recognizes this is one thing, essentially. This is like one item that can have different states. But there's two different kinds on this axis and three different kinds on this axis. And what's really powerful about this is that we can make different properties. So uh, let's go ahead and select our variant. And right now it's a little confused. It says, oh, you just gave me six different things. I don't know how to divide them. We're gonna add a new uh, property to slice up our variants. So let's say this one is active. And then this one is time. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna select our variants here and change what these are. So time is mixed, that makes sense. Active, we're gonna say on. Same thing here, we're gonna say active, off. And then for these guys, the time is going to be before. This one is going to be during. And this one is gonna be after. I know this is really technical. I'll show you guys the payoff in just a moment. So what we've done is we've essentially said, okay, we've mapped out whether it's on or off, and we've also mapped out when it is. If we wanna use this variant, we, or if we wanna use this component, we can't just drag it out because if we try, it's gonna do the entire thing again. So we're gonna go to assets over here, and you can see under here, we have a, our uh, component here. Now let's actually just rename that. I'm going to go to our layers, and let's name it uh, tile. So go to assets, we can see, I have this tile element. If I bring this in, it just has the one. But if we look on the right side here, check this out. We have a switch that can either turn it on or off, whether it's active or not. And we also have this time menu where we can choose if it's before, during, or after. 
that was pretty cool. I don't know about you guys, but that's one of my favorite things about Figma is this really good ability to have these components. Um, and again, if I wanted to change any of these guys, let's say uh, I'm actually gonna go in here and delete these ones and replace them with uh, my version. That's this component. Let's go ahead and go through here. And then this one we want it to be before, this one we want it to be during, and these two we want to be turned off. And you can see even over here, it has the uh, a little toggle switch because I said on and off were the two states it could be. So it's smart enough to know, okay, cool. I'm just gonna give them a toggle if there's two options. Uh, and so now if I wanted to change any of these, check this out. Maybe I don't like this color. I can select all these guys and I can just change that color. And that updates across all of them. Maybe I actually want it to be one of my universal colors. So now it'll it'll conform to that style too. This becomes really helpful uh, once you start prototyping because with buttons, you'll have the two states of the button and with just a tap, you can make it so the interaction will switch between the two states. And it's super duper handy because you just have these little things and you can add as many buttons as you want. And you don't have to do complex trees if there's more than one button on a page. Cool, cool, cool. So that is, or those two rather, uh, components and styles are the things that help you do more things with one thing. What questions do we have about styles and components? We're gonna take a little mini break before we move on. I know it's a lot of information. So if you change the green color style, the variance will also change. I don't know, let's find out. We'll move this guy over. Let's make it a little bit more red. Whoa. And again, this isn't just for consistency. This is also just to ease that workload so that if you do want to change that color, you don't have to go into every single time you used it and change it individually. It saves you a lot of time. Sometimes I'll even put in placeholder colors that have less to do with the color and more to do with the role. So like when I'm doing lo-fi prototyping, I'll have one that's like a uh, negative or positive and I'll just assign colors and they're all the same shade of gray. But when I go through later, I can just add that color in after I've, I've decided what that color is going to be. All right, for our last topic today, we're going to talk about auto layout. I'm actually going to bring in this button over here because a button is a good way to learn auto layout. So what auto layout does is a couple things. Um, the biggest thing it does is it allows us to change the size and scale of shapes based on the content on its inside or the container on its outside. That's kind of the high level overview of what auto layout is. And so, for example, uh, if I have a button, uh, let's say, oh, I accidentally went to edit mode. Let's say I have a little button like this, and we are going to just make it a little done button. And I've centered my text, I've made it scale that width. Um, but if I type something else, like let's say uh, cancel item, oh, that's that doesn't look very good. So what I can do instead, is I can have this button scale to the size of this text box. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and select both of these and I'm gonna press Shift A. And something magical happened. This turned into an auto layout. The way I can tell that is if I go in and instead of press done, I say, can oh, can you see it working? Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's so neat. So we can have internal padding for these objects so that it stays a certain distance away. And we can also have lots of these on the same page. And maybe, you know, let's let's do another button. I, I'm going auto layout crazy. If I select all of these guys, I'm going to make another auto layout. And check that out. Now these are all auto layouted. Another really cool thing is if we have multiple items inside the same auto layout group, you can change not only the padding, but the margin. So now I can expand these and contract these based on what I, I need them to do. I can also change which direction they're going very easily. So if I want this to go right, boom, left, or rather down, right and left, up and down. It's a super easy way if you're gonna be doing stuff between desktop and mobile, I found. You'll have the right to left version. If you have like three different items, they'll be on your website. And then if you wanna do a mobile, you can just push that down and now they're stacked on top of each other, which is super handy. And I can change these all, again, parametrically. So if I go into this guy, oops, Let's actually go through because I think these accidentally got one too many groups. I got a little too excited with it. So if I go in here, we can also change the parameters of these. So 
If I want to say maybe all the sides have the same padding, we can do 100. Oh, that's too much. Okay. We're not doing 100. We're doing 20. And now they all have the same padding around them. And I can change that here if I want. Or I can go into here and I can change the actual padding for each side. So maybe I don't need that much padding on the top and bottom. Let's just give it three. And we're going to give it three there too. So now they're all the same, which is really great. We can also go through and change which side they're anchored to. So right now, they only really have one item on the inside. Well, uh, that'll, that'll come in a moment. So uh, if I were to move this outward, so this is an auto layout group that's changing how tall they are. But I can also go through and say, you know what? I don't even know how wide you need to be. I just know that I want you to fill that container that you're in. So I'm going to go through here. And on the right side, there's this resizing panel. And I can change that. So instead of hugging those contents, instead of looking at that text box and saying, okay, that's all I have on the inside, instead of hugging those contents, I'm going to expand and fill the container. So this is another great way if you have you know, these, these parametric abilities to go left and right. And maybe one last thing for this cancel items, maybe I don't want it to be in the center. Maybe I want it to be flush left for whatever reason. We can go into the same place that we changed all these different parameters for padding, and we can move what it aligns to which is really, really powerful. Let's take a look at an example from here. So, um, and this is something I'm gonna do that I, I didn't do before. Let's take a look at all the different groups inside of this item, because really what auto layout is, is it's just grouping items and deciding how you want them to be aligned and how you want them to interact with each other. So everybody's here, everybody's on there. What are the different groups we can see? <laughs> what are the different groups we can see inside this card? Just start blurting them out. Or Varun. Um, we have the four buttons. Or like the four okay, buttons. so this could probably be a group, right? What else? Header. Yeah, so we have this header. And then we also, I think these could be a group. Or maybe these two are a group. And then that group is grouped with rent. So that's another group, right? What else? What's up? Image. Yeah, so we have an image. I think it's big enough to be its own group, kind of. And then the short description and original. Yeah, so th those could be a group too. And then the other one is just this entire thing can be a group itself, right? All these items are grouped within this panel. So if we go back over to our design, none of these are auto layouts. Let's go here ahead and make them auto layout. So all I'm going to do, I'm going to click on these two guys, shift A, boom, it's an auto layout. Click on this guy, boom, it's an auto layout. Click on this dude, boom, it's an auto layout. Now, something happened there. When you add an auto layout to something that only has one item in it, it gives it a little bit of padding by itself. We're just going to turn that all the way down because we don't need that. We're going to select these four guys, boom, auto layout, and these guys too. Auto layout. So if we select all these, give it an auto layout, let's bring these over this way. And uh, one of the cool things about auto layouts is that because they are frames, we can give them a background and all the effects that we saw from before. So let's add a little fill and let's go ahead and round the corners a little bit. And then we're going to add a drop shadow. That's looking a little cramped. So let's go ahead and add some more padding. All right, so now we have something very similar to what we had before. And if we move it, nothing's happening because we still have to give it those parameters, when to expand and when to contract. So if we double click on this first one, we want it to kind of spread out, right? We have two items in this. We have the left one and the right one. So we want those two guys to push away because we want this rent button to be anchored to that top right corner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click in here and I'm gonna say, instead of hug contents, I want it to fill the container. And instead of this guy, where it's just everything's going up and left as far as it can, we're going to space between. And you can see how that works if I move this left and right. It's just gonna move that with that anchor that I've set. Same thing for this guy, we're gonna have it fill the container on that axis. For this guy, we want it to uh, fill the container on the left and right axis. And we also want it to space between those items. And then same thing for these guys. I actually think, you know, we're going to keep those guys flush locked. And then the last one for this guy, if I move it up and down, I kind of want these items to expand with it. So let's go ahead and say on this axis, we are going to 
space between. And now when I move this, everything's moving with it, which is really great. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell this guy, uh, let's go ahead and fill container up and down too. And we're going to fill container on these as well. So now when I move this up, check that out. All I did was design this first one here. I didn't have any auto layout items. And we've gone to something that looks like this. So when I move it up and down, I can have a mobile card. I can have something that might look uh, more like a website card. I can have like a tablet card. It's one design that goes all over the place. And what's really good about that is that it's versatile. So I only have to design it once. And then later I can kind of play with the specifics about how big I want it to be. But because we designed it parametrically, we're saving ourselves a lot of work and a lot of pixel shifting that would be uh, really difficult otherwise. I also use these not only for UI elements, but I've actually done this before for uh, asking team members for illustrations. So uh, you can see that I have this little uh, auto layout panel and I have uh, which, which panel it's gonna be in the storyboard. I have a description of the illustration and then text that would go along with it. And all of this is done with auto layout. So uh, let's actually, I'm gonna use this lorem ipsum again. Let's get uh, lots of paragraphs about that. Check that out. I have the biggest description in the world, but it's able to fit it inside of this auto layout because it expands to be whatever the size of the uh, items on the inside is. And if I want to, I can have this middle part also auto layout. So if I draw in an image or I bring in an image, it just automatically resizes to be the size of that image. So it doesn't just have to be for production stuff. It doesn't just have to be for your apps. Nobody but my team is going to see this stuff, but it just makes it a little bit easier and a little bit more consistent when I'm trying to communicate with those team members. And then if you're crazy, this is actually something that Varun designed. You can make an entire page using exclusively auto layout. So um, for example, each one of these items has their own little auto layouts on the inside. We can go through and see all these different things here. It's a really handy tool. Uh, to be able to make sure your designs are parametric. So for example, if I wanted this to be one down, I can just click on it and then press the down button. And because we're doing this, it, it just swaps the items. We're doing it parametrically. It doesn't care what that content is. It just knows that it's going to keep it uh, that margin away from each other. All right. And those were the different things that I wanted to talk about today in terms of Figma. We have about 13 minutes left for q and I'd imagine we'd have a couple questions. Uh, so go ahead, now's your time. What questions do we have related to either tools or styles or components or auto layout? Which part? Uh, the, yeah, this part, so how to, yeah. For sure, so I can, I'll kind of walk through it again. So. For example, I did an auto layout for these guys because I want them to stay the same. And I can actually just move how big or small that is here. Yeah. I also have an auto layout between these two items. So that's controlling uh, you know, kind of their block that's on there. So that when I move this left and right, that rent button moves all the way to the right, which is great. Mm -hmm. I have an auto layout here that's controlling the size of the image. So that when I move it up and down, it takes up as much space as it possibly can. I have an auto layout for these four icons so that they expand again for all that space that they have and they kind of distribute themselves evenly. I have an auto layout for these guys so that they stay a certain amount away from each other that I described. And then I have a big auto layout between everything. So I could make it bigger in terms of margin between them. I can also make the padding bigger so that everything kind of gets shrunken down to the middle or I can move them closer to the edge if I wanted to be closer to the edge. Does that make more sense? Uh, and one more, one more question. Mm -hmm. So how to make the make it the same as the top one? How one more time. You, you, you change the size for the frame, and uh, I want to ask how to make these two exactly the same. Uh, I mean, the same as the top one. OK, so the way I would do that, if I'm trying to change the, the size of the frame, is I just go into here. And then line it up. Oh. And then now we have kind of the similar thing there. I can also move this down. So, so you can also small. lay off that top like uh, make the if I put input a different text, is that have also lay off way to make it oh I got you. The same. Yeah, yeah. So if I uh, entered in text instead of big title, maybe we say massive title. Mm -hmm. 
that'll just kind of take up that amount of space and it'll automatically change the size of this item within this auto layout here. Oh. Andrew, what's up? Um, besides the, uh, the shortcut, how else can you auto layout? What other ways? So you can. Like from like two objects. Definitely. So let's let's add an auto layout to these two objects here. We talked about the shortcut, which is Shift A, but you can auto layout any selection or any frame or any group. So if I go to the right here, there's also this button that says auto layout. So I can just add a plus, and that's the same thing as pressing Shift A. Aparna, do we have any questions from the Zoom crew? Uh, I have one. Can I unmute my mic and talk? Yeah, of yes, course. please do. Please do. Um, do you have a like spreadsheet or PDF of all of the important hotkeys for Figma? I do not, but check this out. Um, Andrew, do you know what the hotkey is to show? Oh, the... it's, uh... um, <laughs> There's a button you can press in the app. We're doing some research right now to see what it is. Another um, thing I... is, um, like Quint mentioned earlier, uh, something called community. I know that if you go to community, there's a file that is just hockeys of Figma. Like it just lists all the hockeys of Figma if you'd like. Oh, cool, thanks. Okay, so one of the other cool things about Figma is if you press command P or command slash, you get this kind of search menu. Um, so I can search for shortcuts. Okay, it's uh, control shift question mark. That's intuitive, I guess. So if you click this, it'll actually bring you through a tutorial and it'll have you do them. So I've never turned off multiplayer cursors. So if I do that now, I do option command slash. Oh, it doesn't like that I'm doing that, but I, pr I promise I'm pressing it. <laughs> Maybe that one. Okay. It just does. Oh, did you see how it kind of moved there? So it'll bring you through all of the different UI elements and all the different shortcuts, and it'll kind of train you on how to use them. So you can see I've used all the ones for cursor and I've used all the ones for essential and tools, but I still have some to discover in shape, selection, et cetera. So I, I just searched for, uh, and I did that with command P. If you press command P, you can search for anything in Figma. And I'm gonna search for keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, and it's that first option, press enter, and it'll bring those up. For some things, I actually find it's easier to search for them than it is to uh, actually find them in the menu. So for example, if I wanted a picture in here, I have a really cool shortcut called Pexels. You guys might have used uh, the service before, but they have a Figma integration where uh, you can actually just click on an image and it'll set it as the fill for whatever shape you have on. So it's a really cool way to uh, interact with that too. That's another Figma plugin. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, if we have no other questions, do you mind going through like the file layout of Figma? Like, like, like outside of the chart, like of a page, like just like how can I make a team or how can I make like, yeah. Like, um, sure. Did we have any more questions from the Zoom crew? Because I think we're good here on ground. Perfect. Perfect. So, uh, cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Aparna. Um, so outside of a file, obviously we're inside of the Figma file right now, but outside of that file, there's a whole app attached to it. So if we go home, uh, on the left side, you'll have all your different spaces or projects. There's also a section for recents and drafts. Uh, there's also the tab for the community, so you can browse all these things that I'm talking about. This is where you find plugins and different files. So, uh, for example, if I wanted to search for auto layout here, there are a couple of different auto layout examples where you can learn from how people do these different techniques, which is really, really cool. Gleb has given us some auto layout tips and hacks. So maybe that's a good one to, to look at. Um, but let's go ahead and go back here. And so on the left here, these are all the teams that I'm a part of. If you haven't already, I highly recommend applying for the education uh, thing. Basically, if you have an education Figma account, you will get all the stuff in the pro for free. That's, that's the whole deal. You can use teams and whatnot. So um, on the left here, you can see the different teams that I have. So I've actually made a team just for myself and you can see all the different things I do here. We also have um, a team for one of my other projects. And so you can see all the different kind of folders that we've set up for this team. And these are all different Figma files that we've put into this uh, collaboratively too. And you can see all the different members of this as well. And you can see all the different uh, kind of starred folders that I put on the side. And to open up one of these, uh, let's go into this one. To open up one of the uh, files, you just kind of go in and it opens as a tab up at the top. 
and it'll pop up here in a second. That's how you open a file. Is that your uh, question? Cool, cool, cool. What other questions do we have? Are we all good? Is that clear? Quit. Clear I saw that there was a little like headphones thing on the Figma file. Can you talk more about that? Like when you opened a Figma file, there was a little headphones icon. So uh, I haven't updated the curriculum here. So thank you for uh, bringing that to uh, light. So up next to my face, you'll see a little headphones icon. And this is to start something called a Figma audio call. Basically, Figma said, all right, wouldn't it be cool if people could talk to each other? And then that's what this does. So if I enter into this, oh, now I'm in a Figma audio call. Look at that. You can choose where it's coming from. You can leave if you want. Um, there's also a really fun little interaction that they've made. So if there's multiple people on a file, we can press the backslash button and type on the canvas. And anybody else who's in this file with me will actually be able to see this. So if I'm going through here and I wanted to say, ew, this purple looks garbage, I can say that. And it's just a really easy way to get quick feedback from team members just by pressing the slash button, which is the one next to the question mark. If you want to add something that's a little bit more permanent, we can go to this uh, uh, speech bubble here and we can add in comments. So maybe uh, this person would say title size is good. And let's add an emoji so that they know that we're happy. Cool. In a moment. What's really good about this is that you can use this to track different items. So let's say I had like three action items and uh, this will be one of the action items and um, this will be another one of the action items. As you can go through here and as people raise issues, you can check these off like a list. And I use these all the time for uh, you know feedback, especially when the teacher's going back over it and they say, okay, you should change this, you know, letting on this is too big, you know, the color here is bad. And I go through these and it's basically a to-do list of all the different things I need to change about the app. Dishik, what's up? So you showed us how to make different text styles and you also showed us how to make different color styles. Mm -hmm. So I, I noticed that when you change that purple color style, mm -hmm. um, you change Hello Catherine as well as Oxycodone as well as yep. the, whatever the whatever uh, assets are connected to the color style. Now, mm -hmm. I want to say I have like 50 wireframes, all with like Hello Catherine. I want to change all the Hello Catherine colors uh, from like purple to black without changing everything else from also from purple to black. How do I do that? So you'd want to detach it from that style. So if we go through, uh, Kushik, Kushik asked, what if I had like 50 Hello Catherines, but I only wanted to change one of them, or I wanted to change this without changing all the other things that are purple, right? Yeah. So if you go over here where the color would usually be, it's actually replaced that with your style. And there's this little link breaking icon, and we can click on that. And maybe even though it looks the same, it's the same color, maybe I can add a new style and I'll name this one title purple. And now when I change this title color, it'll be different than the other ones. So if I go through here, I can move this to be maybe that green color. And now none of the other purple items change. So would you recommend that we make that um, explicit when we are making the wireframe? Like this is gonna be the color for the body and this is gonna be the color for the title. If you can, yeah. I, usually when I'm doing lo-fi wireframes, I'll actually change it based on role, like I was talking about. Um, and then once we go through, like, uh, for example, like caption or, you know, these other different things like, uh, you know, cancel or something like that, we'll, we'll do that, not based on the color that it is, but based on the color that it should be, like the role of that color. All righty, it is 559. Uh, thank you guys so much for showing up. This is the first on ground flux workshop in quite a long time. So thank you to all my on ground people and also some zoom love as well. Um, if you guys have more questions, feel free to reach out to me. I am always available and uh, I love to help people with their questions about this kind of stuff. So uh, without further ado, I will let you guys go. Thank you again and uh, I'll see you around. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So how can I, like, uh, if I have questions?